Hello beautiful people, uh, I'm Chris Jones and I'm going to be introducing today's episode of Meet the Scientists uh, for COP26.tv and we're going to be talking with Professor Rowan Sutton. So Professor Rowan Sutton is the Director of Climate Based Science at the University of Reading. Um, his research focuses on ocean atmosphere interaction. And as you're going to find out, that's actually pretty significant and, pr and pretty important in terms of climate change and climate variability, predictability, um, and so on. He's the principal investigator of the multi-center North Atlantic Climate System um, Integrated Study, or ACIS, um, program. And he's the chair of the MET, Hadley Science Review Group member of the Scientific Steering Committee and UK Climate Resilience Program. He's also the lead author of the Working Group One contribution to the fifth assessment of the report and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or the IPCC. So really, really important conversation that we're about to have and I'm really, really excited to talk um, to you Professor Sutton uh, about your work and and really getting to grips with understanding the climate science um, and, and kind of breaking it down for our audience as well. So welcome. Um, how are you doing today? Very good, thanks. How are you? Uh, I'm, I've, I've, my mind's just been constantly blown this whole day, um, just talking to um, amazing different dis interdisciplinary scientists. So, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I'm, I couldn't be happier in some respects and also looking at the topic kind of a little bit sad but yeah it, my brain is all over the place so but um i yeah i want to just get get to sort of grips with um could you just sort of summarize like your current position about climate change currently well we're obviously in a really serious uh, situation the climate has already changed very significantly it's going to continue to change uh, but we have a great opportunity to um, minimize the future damages that climate change is going to cause and that's obviously what COP is all about and it's incredibly important that we take that opportunity we've got to re reduce the amount of warming that that happens in the future uh, we've already had over a degree of, of planetary warming um, if we can have really strong agreements, we could potentially keep future warming um, below one and a half or two degrees, and that would uh, really reduce the, the, the really dangerous impacts, the likelihood of really dangerous impacts in the future that will affect people across the planet. So we've got to take the opportunity. At the same time, we've, we've got to accept that climate will continue to change and we've got to adapt to that reality. So more extreme weather, and the consequences of that we've seen around the world, you know, very recently, floods and heat waves and so forth. So we really have to adapt and take seriously uh, that dimension of climate change, as well as as well as the mitigation side, which is about obviously reducing future warming. Hmm. A big um, a big sort of thing that that keeps popping up, and, and I even had a, a little discussion earlier on uh, on social media with with some people is is a is a belief in the science and and some people uh, i'm actually going to be talking to someone with regard to climate change denial and the psychology of that um following on from this conversation um i, I you know what i really want to kind of get to grips with is is kind of some of the models and and, and what those models mean for you know the, the sort of average person when they when they hear these these terms climate models and you know what what, what does that actually mean and and, and how, how trustworthy are they I, th I think is kind of two really important questions that have come up yeah yeah okay so first of all the basic science of climate change has been understood for well over 100 years you know and it's not complicated actually you know the way ways in which uh, adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere traps heat and causes the climate to warm very well understood now, what do we mean by climate model? We, we essentially mean a, um, a, a, a computer simulation that is, that is based on the laws of physics. So we, we code up the laws of physics through mathematical equations and we use big computers to solve those equations and produce a simulation of the real climate system. So these models are the same kind of models we use for weather forecasting all the time. And of course, we show with skillful weather forecasts how powerful they are. 
But when we're looking at climate change, we're talking about simulations not just for a few days or a few weeks, but for years and centuries, because that's the time scale on which the climate is changing. And um, <clears throat> these simulations uh, represent not just the atmosphere, but also the oceans and the ice and the land and the forests and all these different aspects of the climate system. And we have um, huge confidence in them uh, for, uh, as, as tools for understanding climate change, because we can test them in all sorts of ways against the real world. And in, in particular, they show how um, the climate has changed over the last 100 years as we've increased greenhouse gases, and they do that very accurately. Now, that isn't to say that models are perfect. You know, we have to make some approximations in, in carrying out these simulations, and that's, um, that, that leads to some uncertainties, for example, about changes in uh, ha uh, wind patterns and changes in ocean circulation. These are some of the aspects of climate change that turn out to be quite difficult to really simulate accurately. So we're incredibly confident that you know, the world has warmed up and will continue to warm up, and that leads to increases in sea level rise and uh, increases in heat waves and those kind of uh, changes, uh, extreme temperatures. But there are aspects, like I mentioned, wind patterns, ocean circulation, where we have a bit less confidence, and that's a focus for a lot of our research. So, yeah, one, one thing that, that kind of bothers people when, <clears throat> when they hear scientists talk is, is that they don't necessarily understand the term confidence or uncertainty. So they hear the word uncertainty, and it has a, a sort of colloquial uh, meaning to, to the general population, whereas in, in reality, you know, uh, can you explain like the term uncertainty from a scientific perspective? Because I think it really does mean something slightly different. I'm, I'm really glad you asked me that because, because I think you're absolutely right that, that, that there are lots of terms, in fact, we use in science with sort of fairly technical meanings that aren't the same as the meanings that people would, would uh, associate in everyday life. So when we talk about uncertainty, we're really talking about a range of possibilities and we can quantify that range. So we're not saying we don't know anything. What we're saying is that we, we, we can quantify some prediction within a certain range of possibilities, but we can't narrow it down more than that. So for example, we might be able to say that the temperatures uh, in 2100 could be uh, between three degrees centigrade, uh, uh, warmer than they were in pre-industrial climate or five degrees centigrade. Now that might sound like quite a big range, but actually if you compare it to the full range of possibilities, you know, from let's say from zero up to 25 degrees centigrade, you know, the, 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 that's, that's actually a lot of information that, that is very, very helpful. So that we often use the term uncertainty to represent a range of possibilities. Uh, and that, that's, just, that's just a usage of language. So, so if, if members of the public hear that term, they should say, okay, well, what is the range that we're talking about? You know, could anything happen or, or, or what, what could happen and how well is that quantified? Hmm. And so what, what contributes to, you mentioned some of the things um, earlier, what sort of contributes to, um, particularly with regard to your, your personal research, um, contributes to that uncertainty? And, it, and it's, you know, within a few degrees range is actually <laughs> relatively accurate, as you say. It could be, yeah. to, we could arbitrarily just go 25 degrees, 1,000 degrees, you yeah. know. Um. Yeah, so, so well, when we're thinking about the, the, the uh, rate of warming of the planet, you know, and how much climate change we get in the future, one of the um, uh, important processes is how clouds respond. So clouds change as we warm the climate. Some clouds tend to get uh, thinner, and that means that they reflect less sunlight, and that can enhance the warming. Um, <clears throat> in other regions, clouds may get a bit, a bit thicker or change in height, and that may uh, lead to other changes. So how clouds change turns out to be quite complicated. And because we, we understand some of those details really well, but other aspects a bit less well, that leads to a range of possibilities in terms of exactly how much temperature rise we get in the future for a given level of greenhouse gases. A another example, which is, which is in my area of research, I mentioned ocean circulation. So people may have, you know, may be aware of how, how important the Gulf Stream is for affecting 
European climate, you know, it brings a lot of warm water from further south. That's important for our climate. Now, the Gulf Stream, we think, will change uh, as the climate warms. But whether it will change just a little bit or quite a lot, so let's say, you know, a 10% change or a 50% change, actually, that's that turns out to be quite a tough research question that we're doing a lot of work on at the moment. And we're trying to reduce that range of possibilities so we can make more accurate predictions. So is that the kind of current level, the, uh, the sort of variability we mentioned about uncertainty, sort of between 10 and 50%? So it's very important to bring time scale into this. So, so 10 and 50 percent over what sort of time scale? So I'm talking about over um, maybe maybe 50 to 100 years. So quite a long time scale. It, it, it's not completely impossible that we could see a 50 percent change more rapidly than that, but the current evidence is that's not not very likely. Okay, but those gradual changes and uh, so the the potential implications of having less warm water. I mean, we're in a similar sort of latitude to Siberia, for example. Um, so that is a, is a suggestion that we could get a lot colder as a result. We're, we're never going to get to a situation like Siberia, and that's because, um, firstly, because we're a maritime nation in the United Kingdom. We sit right by the ocean, and that modulates our climate very, very considerably. We don't have the cold winters that you have in the interior of a continent like you do in Siberia, and that will that will always be the case. Um, <clears throat> but it, it is it is possible that changes in ocean circulation could give um, more extreme winters, even in the context of a planet that's warming as a whole. So it seemed very surprising, uh, but if we had big enough changes in the Gulf Stream, we could get that sort of thing going on. So 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 even though, as I say, there'd be the ongoing warming of the planet as a whole, regionally we might have some surprising weather, including more extreme winters.